My name is Kathleen Hake. In the SCA, I'm Kathleen Red Rider. And typically people know me because I bring a carriage to um, SCA events. Uh, sometimes I do ride, but carriages are what I'm primarily into. And so we're going to take about four to four to five thousand years of history and and try to condense it down into a really quick 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So if you have questions, feel free to ask them as we go or put them in the chat and I will try to answer them. As we get started, we do need to know that sometimes even though it's in a drawing, it's not accurate. Um, as we know from the famous egg horses, uh, drawings are as good as the artist is. And a lot of artists just don't have a lot of practice creating wagons, harness, and horses. So um, we kind of take what we see and hope for the best. And sometimes it just doesn't make sense. And other times it makes perfect sense. What we like to see is things like this, where we actually have a, a treasurer had a record of a sale of an old carriage. Um, so basically, this gentleman. Uh, this Earl traded in his um, carriage for um, some cash and was going to get a new one, which is great to see, not only because we can re all relate to it, but also there's definite records. Even when we look at written records, um, particularly 18th or 1800s on, there are occasions where the written record doesn't match a drawing and or what we see in a museum. So even with written records, we try to be a little careful about that because um, sometimes the person who was writing really wanted to be in favor with whoever he was writing about. So the coach or whatever it is, carriage, um, may be embellished or flat out lied about. <laughs> um, to make that person look good. So we like records like this, we like actual finds, those type of things when we're talking about carriages because there's just a lot of information out there that we don't necessarily know. And as we start, I am gonna say that every time they find a new dig uh, uh, site with a carriage in it, we learn something new. So things that they thought were true even in the 1980s um, sometimes have been proven not to be. And so we know that as we go along, we kind of have to roll with it. And if there's a chapter that has been proven wrong in a book by a find, uh, it just means we have to read the rest of the book a little bit more carefully. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. So as we get going, we need to know about the animals. So there are some, we think of uh, carriages with um, horses but they're not always that way. A lot of times they were oxen. Sometimes they were um, a derivative of a donkey. Other times they were horses, but they're not always the size that we think they are. Oxen were early um, pullers of, of wagons and, and different things, and they were domesticated in 500, or excuse me, 5,000 BC. This is a set of oxen that live up in um, I believe it's in Vermont, New Hampshire. And this is their actual size. They are big. We tend to think of uh, cows and, and that type of thing as smaller things. We tend to maybe think of them as like um, jerseys or, or something that's just a little smaller. This size of an animal did um, exist in Europe at various times. Um, they still have them. And uh, so we need to adjust our thinking when we're talking about how big these animals are and how much weight they could pull. So around 4,000 BC, horses become domesticated. We have two horses here. Um, the one in the black and white is Aiken, who is a fjord. And he's about the size of horses when they were first driven. Fjords happen to be one of the oldest breeds. The Vikings used them. And you can see, if you look over my shoulder, that my, the view over my shoulder, you can't see his back. Um, he's, he's short. Draken, who is in full color, 
is a standard bred, and he is the size of an average horse today, about 15 two, and he would have been typical of early coaching horses. You can tell he's clearly able to see his back um, from my shoulder. So there is a little, quite a bit of height difference at times between the, the breeds, and so that can be an issue when we're talking about carriages and um, different uh, animal-driven vehicles, animal pool vehicles. So we go from this well-trained team of oxen to something that is the size of a Clydesdale, um, which most people know because of the Budweiser Clydesdales. The Shires um, are the closest of the um, middle age is type heavy horse. Um, and they're roughly the same size as a Clydesdale. So we have three different sizes here. All of them would have been in play at certain different times in this history that we're gonna be talking about. Sledges, sleigh, sleds, and sleighs. So it turns out that sledges are very useful. And this was one that um, was at Ur. And the really important thing about this one is the bend in the wood. You can see that huge bend. And you think, well, why didn't they all have that type of a bend? And the answer is the type of wood that we see. Um, so we, at this point in time in Ur, it's actually fairly um, wet. And the trees that are growing there have wood that is fairly easy to bend. When we start talking about places that are really cold in places like Sweden and Norway and that, we're talking about a different type of tree and that doesn't bend quite as well. So you start seeing things like this one, which is actually um, has a lot less curve in it. It's a little bit more square. What makes it fancy is the decoration within the wood or on the wood and not necessarily the shape of the wood. And so as we go forward here, these are even into the 15 and 1600s. And you can still see, because we're talking about places that have um, harder wood, heavier wood, that we're still not getting quite as much of the curve. And if you look at these closely, you'll see that they're actually in some places jointed. That's not a um, complete piece of wood. And we really didn't, we kind of lost that skill to a certain extent, and uh, then they got it back around the 1700s and, and started using different wood, that type of thing. This uh, one that is fancy is for going out and being on parade and being seen in. Um, this carved and painted sleigh uh, would also have been out and about, but probably not quite as um, ornate, uh, as a situation as the sledge. Uh, the sledge itself is a statement piece and it would have been finely decorated. There would have been plumes on the horses, that type of thing. Whereas the carved sleigh may have had a decorated horse, um, but probably um, a little bit more practical. And it, it's just a classy versus a showpiece. So those are some things that we see with the sleighs and sledges. And that's why there's some differences in the wood. Um, Europe in general has much heavier wood than some of the other places. And let's see what happened. Ah, here we go. All right. So eventually we get to wheels, right? An important thing. All right. 3500 BC, wheels vehicles appear, followed by roads and simple bridges. So the first wheels, you know, we don't know 100% what they were made of, but we think that they were made from trees that were two to 300 years old. So they would have been pretty round. I, I assume that you would not be able to get your arms around it. Um, so they're, they're big sized chunks of wood and they would have been heavy, they would have been awkward, and they would have been slow. Faster than, than hauling stuff by hand probably. And certainly if you could hook an animal to it, it would be easier than um, hauling it yourself, but not as sophisticated as this wheel that we see 
um, over here from India. And um, it's really interesting that in India, they still use uh, solid wood wheels. Um, in 1986, India had um, roughly 15 million animal drawn vehicles still, and only 7% had white uh, rubber tires because of the train and the um, environment there, these type of, uh, this type of wood doesn't rot and it just works better for them than having the uh, rubber tires. Which seems a little odd to us because in America we have rubber tires on everything. So when did the wheel appear? Well, it didn't appear in any one spot and just come out of it and, and make that the center of the wheel. It really did, uh, started about 3500 BC in multiple places, uh, Eastern Europe, Russia, Iraq, um, those type of areas all had things happening about the same time. And apparently when we just kind of get that part in civilization, that's what we start thinking about is wheels and how to make things go faster and how to make them more efficient. And in some cases, how to be more effective with your military. So the earliest well-dated depiction of a wheel vehicle is 3,500 to uh, 3,350 BC, and it's a clay pot, it's a drawing on a clay pot. So we don't really have a wheel from then, but we kind of think we know what they look like. As far as the wheel and axle, which is a more interesting combination, um, the, la the earliest one that they had dated as of uh, a year or so ago was this um, one in Sylvania. And uh, it was quite interesting. The wheel itself was made from oak and ash, and it's 27 and a half inches in diameter, a radius, sorry. So it's a pretty big wheel. There are a couple of other wheel and axles that we know about. And one, the wheel and axle rotate together. And then the other one, the axle stays still and the wheel rotates around the axle. And those, again, same time period, but different places in the world. And so they just come out a little differently. In China, the wheel was uh, certainly present with the adaption of the chariot in 1200 BC, although there's quite a few arguments now um, for earlier wheels. And as we get to know more and more about China and some of the things that we maybe didn't have access to 20 years ago, um, we just are finding that they were earlier and earlier. And the same is true with um, Russia. There were some new digs that have come out that I don't have the details for, but there are finding things that are earlier than they thought. And be, it's just because we're getting access to it that we maybe didn't have before. So to wrap up the wheels a little bit, um, 2500 to 2600 BC, leather wheel coverings are introduced. And then we get, uh, copper nails. And around the 2000 BC is when the uh, Celts created the spoke wheel. 1500 BC, we start seeing iron making. And by 700 BC, iron tires, which are um, requiring a more skilled labor, are introduced. Um, by 400 BC, the, the Celts are developing a shrink-fitting iron tires. and um, 210 BC, the Chinese have dish wheels, which give the vehicle some extra strength, the, the wheel. And it has to do with the physics as to how that dish works. Um, and we can go into that if you have a question about it. So we now get to the wheel, uh, war vehicles, which is usually the favorite part of everybody. Um, and if you have questions as we go along, please feel free to ask. I don't think I'm seeing the chat. Um, Oops. So you may have to interrupt and feel, but feel free to make sure. Ah, there we go. I can see the chat now. 
Okay. So we have these four wheel vehicles that are pulled by oxen because they're still very heavy. And this is an ur. And there's some debate as to what exactly these are and what they were used for. But the idea is, is that um, the, this is the war panel on this side. And you can see that they have some spears, we have some arrows, that type of thing. Um, in relation to the horses, we can really see on this um, some definition in the horses. We can see the wheels. Um, and these are two planks of um, wood that have been put together and then uh, hooked uh, onto an axle. So chariot warfare often was considered to be part of the nobility. Um, you just, they are expensive to build and they fielded hundreds and hundreds of these at various times but it, it, it took a long time to build one. And so it's estimated that it took about 600 man hours to build a two-wheeled Egyptian chariot. And the reason why is because you have to bend all that wood. And horses are expensive to maintain and buy and feed and all that type of stuff. So some of the war chariots are quite flashy. Um, they're bright red chassis and light colored trim. Um, a lot of cross diagonals and spots on the fenders and decorative shields on the sides. And then the horses were, uh, in some cases, very brightly turned out. Um, at this point in time, it is still masculine to be in a chariot or a carriage. And the king himself is, is shown driving a chariot. It's um, highly doubtful that he would have been seen driving something that was not presentable. Um, so it probably, whatever he was driving was sturdy, it um, held together well, it could go into war, and um, was turned out in a way that was befitting his status. The interesting thing about the Ur Tablet of Ur is how this relates to modern carriage driving. Um, this is the bottom photos are from combined driving, which is very popular right now. And you can see that there's some relationships between the two. Um, basically, their idea here is to go fast, be able to take um, turns and, and go in and just kind of guns blazing. And so the people in the back, um, they kind of help stabilize things. In the war um, panel, of course, they are going in to shoot arrows and such. The people on the back in combined driving, their job is to make sure that everybody gets through safely. Well, I shouldn't say that. Their job is to keep all four wheels on the ground and to um, put themselves out there if a horse needs help. Um, they can get down on the ground and help while the driver stays in the seat. But there are correlations, and in some cases, um, particularly early versions of the combined driving marathon vehicle uh, were called war wagons. And you can definitely see how they may be related. So now that we're getting moving along into this reconstruction of a Celtic two-wheel war chariot, and down here on the bottom are a Hittite one, we're getting into the period where the Romans are out here. And I, I have to get a kick out of Julius Caesar. He, he really liked um, some of the Britain uh, vehicles and they were really, the vehicles themselves, we kind of think of, of carriages as wanting to be quiet. They were very loud. Um, sometimes they had uh, blades on the wheels and we'll see one of those just shortly. Um, and when they brought these vehicles back to Rome, they used them as a pleasure vehicle. They decorated them. And because of the luxury scene, uh, they were seen as being effeminate, but generals and emperors could still use them as travel vehicles. It's, it's not at this point in time um, really a bad thing to have one. It's just kind of, you know, if it was really flashy, 
that wasn't considered a great thing. Um, Cicero is supposed to have imported one and said it was the only pleasing thing which that benign country ever produced. So that was, that was really something um, to see these come over and uh, do their thing. I'm just gonna check and make sure that there are no questions. Oops, I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing that chat feature. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. All right, so often a question is, well, how did these blades on wheels work? And there are a lot of theories about it. Um, this particular piece is a grave good out of China. And the uh, blade is mounted uh, over the axle cap um, on the wheel. So um, even if you broke this, it technically speaking, unless you happen to break the cap of the axle at the same time that was holding the wheel on, which would have been harder to do, uh, it would still use, your wheel would be okay. There are a lot of different theories about how these type of blades worked, whether they worked. <laughs> um, when you hit somebody with one of these, even if it's really sharp, you're gonna feel it with that vehicle. And so really, yes, you know, you might get lucky and hit somebody, but it was to break the formations. And it didn't take, uh, armies very long to figure out how to effectively counter against these and basically they would break formation the chariots would go in and then they would swarm behind them and so there are various theories about other ways that spears were mounted on chari chariots and how they were mounted down the pole between the horses and and on the yokes and different things and some of them are quite elaborate I'm not sure how practical they would be. Um, there are some documentation where things were tried. Just because you try them doesn't mean that they were really successful. Um, however, they look really cool in the movies and that's what a lot of people are interested in. So um, they did actually mount different knives on um, wheels and in some cases actually um, put them through the wheel themselves. So. That's something that next time you're watching an old movie, you can take a look at. Okay, um, you may be familiar with some of this. This uh, was one of the chariots that they kind of designed um, for the Nova um, building the uh, Pharaoh's chariot. So I'm not gonna go into that very deeply other than to just say, notice on here how the harness works on this uh, horse. It comes around the neck and around the girth and the actual attachment to the carriage is um, on his neck uh, right right above the withers and so that's very different and you can kind of see where this horse can swing his butt out and which uh, as long as they're going straight and everything's going well that's okay but if they decide that they want to split or be bad you have a hard time controlling this horse um, because he can swing his body wherever he wants to a certain extent. Um, Mike Lodes has done a bunch of research and has a wonderful display on um, the Britain ones and uh, Iron Age Celtic. And when he first started, he had some trouble with his horses. At this point, he makes it look easy. Um, and uh, has, has just done a wonderful job. I'm not quite sure if he still has those horses. I know he's been out and about, but I think he's, he's um, down, downgrading his uh, um, housing and, and such right at the moment. But uh, this type of configuration hangs out, uh, stays with us for quite a while. When we figure out how to work the breast collar and the full collar that goes around the neck, it makes a lot of difference because well, this doesn't really choke a horse. It doesn't let them use their body to help them pull. Um, and it can, can affect their breathing a little bit. All right, so we're now gonna put it all together. We had the roll, we had the log, and then we figured out about the sledge so we could pull things. And then we thought, well, we have this log that was way easier to roll things on, but we had the sledge, so let's put them together. 
And then the sledge wore a groove in the log. We thought, hmm, that's not a bad deal. And then we said, well, why can't we just put the wheels and the axle together and maybe fix it so that it doesn't roll off the piece of wood? And then we got into the actual um, axles and, and wheels and that type of thing. So we've got that far now. And so we start talking about um, trans actually using this as transportation and going some places. When you have these type of vehicles, um, we typically think of wheels as being very heavy and large, particularly here in the United States, we kind of got that Conestoga wagon um, thinking going on in our, our brain in the back. This was used on the Silk Road and you can see that there's like 32 spokes in here. The reason why is because this road was really uh, used a lot and had uh, at times some, some great big potholes and other things. And so the more spokes you put into it, the more it can absorb the concussion and spread it out, okay? It's not one, it's like when you put your hand down, it, this, when you hit it like this, your whole hand hurts. But if I put just down a finger, well, it only hurts here for a minute. So if you, that's kind of the, it spreads out that concussion. And if you break one, yes, it's a problem, but there's a possibility that you could find a twig or, or a stick that would fit back in to, to repair it yourself versus a bigger wheel that you would have to have um, help repairing. And on a well-traveled road, you may not have trees really nearby that you can do that with, but you also, if you lose one, you still have 32 other, or 31 others to help absorb that concussion. And so as long as you don't use a lot of them in one spot, this type of wheel is really great for long distance traveling over some, some rougher uh, terrain. We did not use this in the United States because we had mud issues and this doesn't go real well in mud. So we're moving along and we get into these bigger, heavier wagons. And this is a reconstructed Roman passenger wagon, whereas the other vehicle was for trade. Uh, you may sit on it, but you can tell it's not really made. You can see the little ledge there, but it's not really made for people to ride in. It's made to transport goods. Whereas this wagon um, may have transported goods, but it was also meant primarily made to move people. Um, Unfortunately, the leather suspension straps that were used here, um, that was a Cel Celtic technique, and they lost it for a long time, um, how, the knowledge on how to do this. And then it was reintroduced about 900 AD, and they used chains instead of straps. Um, and it's just an interesting thing that you can lose that type of technology and then eventually come back around to it. Um, going back to China, um, this was part of the terracotta army, um, but is very typical of some of the vehicles that we see out of that area. Um, you know that the axle is directly under the vehicle, and also on the roof, it is dished out and can protect them from rain and, and that type of the elements. Um, that is a huge difference between vehicles that are driven by the owner. Um, they usually are covered so that the owner is able to stay dry and those um, driven by servants. Usually we don't care whether or not the servants are um, out in the weather. This vehicle also has a lot of spokes and they are dished. They have a slight dish to them um, to give them extra strength. You also note that we have a change in the harness, and this is a more efficient harness. Uh, it um, comes more to the back and um, doesn't interfere as much with the horse's breathing. And there's a lot of, I don't wanna say a lot of controversy right now, but more and more things are coming out and they're really debating on how this harness evolved and when it evolved and that type of thing. And that's one of those, you know, 
we all keep learning. The vehicles that we saw previously are, are pretty practical. Um, they may have had some ornamentation um, carved into the wood, but in general, they're pretty practical. This one um, was found in a Danish bog, and it is much more decorative. Um, unfortunately, you know, I'll, at the end of the day, we don't know exactly what it was used for. We can guess that it's some type of ceremonial vehicle, um, because typically speaking, you don't take this type of vehicle out to do work in. Um, you would mess it up. But it is a lovely example of what it is and um, really details the work that is being done on some of these vehicles or can be done and um, is just beautiful. And you can see how the wheel has um, changed. A lot of the um, wheel pieces have disintegrated so they have um, supported them with metal that of course wasn't there originally. Unfortunately, after the Romans, there really isn't a lot of horse-drawn vehicle advancement for several years. Um, carts are usually used for local travel and farm work, and, and, and not a lot of exploration happens for a while. Um, as an idea as to when this happened, the last recorded chariot race in Rome itself took place in the Circus Maximus in 549 AD. And then we get to the collar. Um, this, the collar is, the evolution of the collar is considered one of the most important things in history because it affects how we travel, how we um, agri do agriculture. It, it just affected a lot of things that in culture too, because then all of a sudden we could travel more easily and so they really figure out how to make this collar and a horse can put its weight into it and suddenly while they're still not as fuel efficient as an ox they're definitely faster and they are great for short distances and for agriculture work um, because they're a little faster than an ox an ox uh, will go for a long long distance on very little fuel in general but they're not very fast, and a horse can is is faster. But you can see here um, that they just have figured that on that collar and how things go. The interesting thing is, is we figure out the collar, but we really didn't figure out how shafts work. So we still see a lot of horses as a pair, which is two horses, or um, if they're agricultural, we'll use third team, or as a four in hand. Um, not a lot of single. Uh, horses being used for um, other things. You see a lot like this. Um, this is 450 BC and this is considered a women's wagon. You can see that it's richly decorated, a lot of fringe, lots of either um, decoration in the side of the vehicle itself or um, painted on. And then it looks like some type of carpet is on the roof. The horses also are really richly um, turned out and there is somebody, uh, I'm assuming a servant, uh, walking beside them. There is nobody in the driver's seat. There is no driver's seat. Um, so somebody walks with them in all cases. And that's why he has to stick, the long stick, so he can reach over and tap the chest of the horse on the other side if he needs to. We have, we're going to back to the ship. Remember we talked about the sledge earlier. This is from the same find. And we know that the um, three of the sledges were very ornate or more ornate. And then there was one that was a working sledge. And then there was this wagon. And this is very richly carved. So we don't think that it was, you know, a working wagon. Uh, I know that there is a gentleman that has made another copy of this. And um, the one thing that you will definitely note is that it's very hard to turn this vehicle because there is a piece of wood that runs down the middle. And so when you turn the wheels, you have to be careful that you don't hit that 
um, piece in the middle and break your wheel. So that's one of the things with these is you make a arc, you don't make a, a circle, real quick circle. All right, we're bumping along to the 15th century and all of a sudden covered carriages come into being. Um, Frederick II um, used one in 1474 to visit Frankfurt. Imperial coaches had leather traces and we st um, start seeing more and more laws about um, who can and can't use coaches. So it's not until we get into the 17th century that we start seeing um, books written on um, cultural permissions as to who does ride in a coach and who doesn't and how people should be dressed when you're in a particular coach and that type of thing. But all the way back to Roman times, there are um, rules in place as to who can and can't um, drive different types of vehicles. And in um, certain vehicles were reserved for um, more upstanding citizens. And then certain vehicles were reserved for commoners. And in Rome, some were reserved for women and uh, men were not allowed to drive them. And by 1560, Antwerp, Belgium has 500 coaches. This vehicle is from Laos and it's from 1560. It's a ceremonial vehicle. Um, I wanna say that it was pulled by elephants, but I, I'm sorry, I just forgot. Uh, but it is a big vehicle. Um, and it's a good reminder that just because we look at um, primarily England and France and, and that area, um, there are still carriages and things being developed in other parts of the world. And some of them are absolutely fabulous in their craftsmanship. So we're gonna go over to Spain and look at this uh, vehicle for just a little bit. Um, we see this is something very common. Uh, this gentleman is again on a wagon that has no seat. So all of his goods are inside. Um, this kind of looks like it might be a dragon or, or a royal bird of some sort on the um, arch of the, uh, on the covering. The wheels are a pin holding on the wheel, which means that if you broke it, you could um, knock the pin out, pull the wheel off, repair or replace the wheel, and then slide it back on and put the pin in and go down the road. Um, and you can kind of see that this has a lot of pins putting it together um, on that side. The gentleman is riding his donkey um, mule. It's not quite clear which one this is. Um, it does look to be a smaller one. I would guess that this is probably the size of Frida, if you, if you happen to know Frida the mule. Um, because the gentleman probably wouldn't be that big and he is in proportion to this uh, animal. Uh, you also notice that the collar is attached to the pole that goes between them at the front of the collar, or excuse me, um, at the top of the collar and down at the bottom. Um, so the how this is pulling on them is much more uh, closer to what we know today. And um, it would have been a more efficient way for them to go. It is kind of odd that they don't have any other harness on them. And it's hard to tell with something like this, did they really not have any breaching or anything else? Or did the person just not know how to draw it? Because there is so much detail in the carriage, I tend to think that they don't have breaching um, and that they're hooked more like oxen are today than they are like a horse. Uh, this is from Spain. Going over to the Netherlands, um, Gilliam Boonen started building carriages in the Netherlands and in 1564, he finally made it to England and introduced uh, carriages there. There really weren't chariot carriages. I mean, there were chariots, but there weren't really carriages or ornate ch carriages like we think of today uh, until about this time. And then by, there was this like, huge boom 
and by 1636, within a four mile radius of London, um, there were 6,000 plus, plus or minus a few um, coaches. And that caused congestion. It wasn't until London really burnt uh, that they were able to widen roads and make sure that everybody could get through. Um, and you really had to get out of the way because these people would just send somebody through that would say, hey, carriage is coming. And you had to get out of their way or they would run you over and they really didn't care. Um, and that was a problem. This vehicle you can see is pulled by six horses. Um, as roads get better and we start getting into coaching um, in the 1800s, it because gentlemen don't drive more than four horses. Uh, and, but before then, you really see six, sometimes eight. And that's because the mud was so bad. The roads um, were lacking in quality. And so they just kind of had to do that to be able to get through. I'm assuming these horses probably um, did have some color to them. It's hard to know. Um, there was some rumors about white horses, et cetera. But pretty ornate vehicle. Uh, if I remember correctly, the description of this in the newspaper was quite a bit different than the actual vehicle. And uh, you can see that there's some curve um, at the bottom of the carriage uh, that probably wasn't there in real life. Now we skip ahead to 1596 AD. In 1596, um, Mortz celebrated the question, christening of his daughter, Elizabeth, and he had a tremendous tournament. We don't really know who compiled this manuscript, but the costumes in it were amazing. And one of the things that are, is in there is this colorful drawing of what is essentially a organ being played, I believe. So this is be your first bandwagon, I think. Um, there are a couple things that you can see, A, He's going to have to go pretty well straight. This person that's actually, I think this is an angel on the uh, vehicle. And you would probably need an angel with you because this vehicle is not turning. The wheel, if it moves right now as it's drawn, would run into the side of the cart, of the carriage, and um, you wouldn't be able to turn, which ironically is a problem that they have with bandwagons that were made in the 1800s as well. Um, the Horses are turned out in amazing uh, day wear. And the faces on the horses, this gentleman's face, I don't know who that gentleman is, but the artist was quite good to be able to do that. And then the um, large polka dot um, turnout for the horse behind it is quite as interesting as well. Um, you can take some guesses as to the symbolism of this and see whether or not you feel that they apply. Um, either way, it's an interesting look at uh, how carriages uh, were perceived for pageants. If you were in the winter, that sleigh that we looked at, uh, that sledge that we looked at um, back at the very beginning, that's the type of thing that you would see at a pageant in the winter, uh, some type of winter turnout. And then we're going to make another big jump to 1600. And this is from Poland. Unfortunately, I haven't quite made my way through the translation yet, so I'm not quite sure whose vehicle this is. Um, but you can see it's very lavishly done. Uh, this is pretty typical of what you can see at this point in time. Um, I have some other things that I could read you about how these vehicles were turned out, but I think we're gonna run a little short on time. But skins, um, leopard print, um, all types of, of different skins were in here. Um, everything was padded, um, very richly turned out. The flaps on the side um, could be rolled up to allow air in um, and put down if it was dusty or the weather was bad. And the steps out of this is just amazing. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't personally seen this one, so I'm not quite sure how these steps work, um, but it looks like this flap folds up so that step is permanently there. And just the flap that uh, covers the ground 
make sure you don't get dirty, um, your shoes dirty, um, is there. Now you can see that this vehicle is suspended uh, with leather straps and it has the ability to turn a little bit better than the other vehicles. Um, unfortunately, uh, some, of these, some of these rode well and others would give you um, travel sickness and they had a lot of swaying back and forth. It depend on how, uh, this, how well they made they were and how tight the braces were. We do also have practical vehicles. Um, and the really interesting thing about this is, this is from Pompeii. And we don't really talk very much about Pompeii because of course it got filled in when the volcano erupted. But uh, if you wanna read some interesting details, they have uncovered a um, wagon shop or wagon merchant of some sort uh, in Pompeii. And so that they know some of what was happening there. And there's a book uh, that's on transportation in Pompeii, um, which is one of those things where you have to look when you're talking about trying to find resources. It's not under carriages, it's under um, transportation. And um, so if you are Googling, it just won't pop up. But this is a wonderful wine wagon. You can see they're unloading the wine in the back filling the jugs. This actually is kind of cut in the middle. So I think that this front wheel maybe is a little high, it's hard to tell, but if it was a little shorter, it might fit underneath there and be able to turn really well. Um, that's one of those things where you kind of have to take a guess as to whether or not it was actually happening. Um, and we would like to believe that maybe it could. This also, um, could, looks like it could be pulled by either horses or humans, probably horses when it's full, maybe some humans uh, afterwards. But it's nice to see a vehicle that has some practical use as well. And this is right after SCA um, time period. This is 1640 AD. And we go to look at this, um, we can see how richly turned down it is and they just get more and more ornate from here, um, particularly if you have a lot of money. Um, and by 1680, glass windows were introduced. Um, prior to that, once they figured out how to essentially make windows and it's not just the roll up flaps anymore, um, they put in blinds and um, the leather straps, um, would, that we talked about earlier as far as uh, suspension on the vehicle would kind of make you sway a little bit. And so there are also leather straps in the compartment that work like a um, chicken strap does in the, a truck. So you could grab a hold of it and hold yourself uh, steady. And um, these vehicles also would have been very richly turned out. The straps in some cases is not leather, but actual um, cloth. Uh, like a uh, heavy ribbon type of thing, um, trim work. And they were really richly turned out at, at times, uh, even before they figured out the glass windows. Uh, this is a slight, uh, around the same time, 1680. You can see a little bit more idea of how they're turned out. This one might be a little ornate as far as the put, pushing, plushness of it, but it's not that far from how some of these vehicles are done. You can see the beautiful um, ceiling in it. Uh, and that was true of early vehicles as well, pre-1650. So resources. Um, Mike Lode's page, he has some really great things about the British chariots. Um, and he has done some really neat things. Uh, the Ralph Strauss book and the Ezra Stratton, they are, are older books. Uh, they were written in the late 1800s um, and reprinted both of them, I believe. However, they have held up really well. Um, they were pretty tight researchers when they were, were writing. Uh, there are some little things in here that, you know, as we learn more and more may not hold up, but their overall concepts have been pretty well. Uh, the book from Spain 
came out uh, within the last three years. I think it's about $150 American. Uh, I do have access to a copy. It is in the office of the Carriage Association of America. And if you are in Lexington, Kentucky, uh, they are located at the Horse Park and they have uh, almost all these books in their library. Uh, Stuart Piggott has some really lovely books. Uh, he is one that uh, his work has been countered by uh, new finds. And in the one book, he says, well, forget that whole chapter that I wrote in the book before, because we now know a completely different thing. And uh, really, there were some things that happened in the 1980s that really changed the way that they looked at carriages and some new finds. And so I do give him a lot of credit for saying, you know, things changed. Uh, but I still think that uh, any of his books are a pretty good read. Ways of the World by M.G. Lay is a book that has been used in um, colleges for a very long time. It is a good book, very interesting book, really talks about transportation and roads. And until you really start thinking about how roads work, um, you can't really understand carriages, wheel, carriages and wheels because until they figure out roads, uh, the wheels get really interesting <laughs> um, and what they have to do and the laws and, and things to protect the roads um, gets really interesting. This next book, unfortunately, I don't know how you say that. Um, it is in Polish. It's a really interesting book, uh, just the pictures, but I've not been able to translate. Uh, the book by Tar, The History of Carriages, is a really popular book. It's usually fairly inexpensive. Uh, the problem with Tar is that he does not give any references, and he had somebody draw what he feels like the vehicles turned out to be, which in most cases is fairly accurate. But um, in the SEA, if you're using something for ANS, uh, Tar is not the best reference out there. Uh, Chariot by Arthur Cottrell is an interesting book, um, but it's more Roman, that type of thing, but it gets into some detail. So if you're interested in that, um, you might take a look. Okay, I'm having trouble seeing the chat feature. So if you have any questions, uh, just feel free to bounce in and ask them. Um, actually, there was one question. Um, it was posted on Facebook a little okay. while ago. The horses in the picture of the Nova chariot um, look kind of stressed. Would you be able to confirm or deny that? Well, I don't think they're stressed in, oh my goodness, you know, we need to go save them. Uh, this was something where you're in a period, you know, uh, they're being well taken care of and that type of thing. There's no neglect going on, but they are being asked to do something that they're not necessarily trained to do. They may have, I, th I think they were trained to drive before um, this procedure, or this this uh, documentary was made. I, I can't be sure. I remember the one that they started from scratch, but that might be the chariots, the Pharaoh's chariot. Um, but this type of driving um, gives a horse a lot of freedom. And we have tried in, since then to do dorsal driving and different things, and it never really works out. Um, the type of driving we have now with the sh uh, traces and that type of a setup seem to give a horse a little bit more security. With this here, if he swings his body around, all of a sudden his neck is, is his, the front of his body, his forelimbs and everything are having to stay where they are because they have pressure on them. But the whole rest of his body can go wherever it wants to go. And it seems to be, um, I don't wanna use the word distressing because I don't think that's the right word, confusing maybe for some horses uh, to have that much freedom and really not have a lot of direction. Uh, and you also have no blinkers. Um, blinkers came along and then they couldn't see behind them. 
um, which helps a little bit because you can't see the spear being thrown over top of your head and, um, or you know the dogs that are running over here or that type of stuff and it makes you more focused. Uh, there's a lot that's going on with these horses as far, they're being, there's a lot of freedom there. Um, and I think that that may be causing some anxiety on their part. But <clears throat> if you watch the videos for this, uh, they settle in and they got it done. Uh, and you can train them. Like I said, Mike has put a lot of time into his um, and really, really worked with them. But the lifespan of these horses back then was not very long. Uh, not quite entirely sure what it actually is during this period of time. But I know when we get into workhorses of um, the 1800s and such, they only last while they were in work for about three years. And uh, then they would either be retired to lighter duty or they would um, be destroyed. And so uh, the reality is that this was uh, a lot of the horses, uh, the training was a little quick and probably not uh, quite as friendly as our training today. But uh, these particular horses are, are, they're okay. It was just a momentary thing. Uh, as far as if you are looking to have a chariot or a vehicle for SCA purposes, um, I get asked a lot about having a chariot. Chariots are designed for two horses. Um, that's how they're balanced. I personally do not like to see a chariot being used with one horse. I know that some people have done it. Um, it's not my preference. And in most cases, it is not a properly balanced vehicle, which means that you do have too much weight on your horse's back. Um, if you were going to build one from scratch and um, wanted to possibly look at some resources, uh, there is a vehicle that was made here in the United States and Canada called the Rod, excuse me, the Red River Cart. And um, there are some very similar ones during the Middle Ages. But the Red River cart uh, is made entirely with no metal. There is no metal whatsoever. Um, so it is, if you don't have the resources to uh, make the metal pieces for your cart and you wanna make one from scratch, a Red River cart is a good option. Uh, the wheels are hide covered, which was something that was definitely done. And um, everything else on it is wood. The cool thing about the Red River cart was it was a trader's vehicle, and so it was designed to come apart. Remember those pegs we talked about earlier on the wheels? So you could tap the peg out, pull the wheels off, put everything into the body of the vehicle, um, and then take it across the river, get to the other side of the river, put the wheels back on and pop it all together, and go on your way. Uh, so that also makes it easy to break down if you want to take it somewhere on an SCA adventure and you can't quite get it into your trailer. You need to slip it into the back of the truck or something like that. So um, there are uh, plans out there if you want to make something from scratch. Uh, Dan Denny, who unfortunately I just forgot his SCA name. Uh, anyways, he has made a vehicle. And that is quite nice. He made it um, using the base of a Meadowbrook cart, um, which is an option as well. The biggest thing you have to make sure is that your cart is balanced. And that means that you're um, ideally, when you're sitting in it or you have the amount of weight in it that you think you will have um, the vast majority of the time, that you're not putting a lot of pressure on the horse's back. You should only be putting maybe five, 10 pounds of pressure. So that means that a human being should be able to easily hold the shafts while you get in and out of the vehicle and sit. Um, and that's what we're looking for, ideally. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if you have any questions, I am always on the SCA Equestrian page. So I, oh, hi. I just, I just found my unmute button again. Sorry. Um, you said earlier about that there were like laws about who could and couldn't drive certain vehicles. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was in Roman times, you said. Was that it, like, technically speaking, who's allowed to drive them or like who's allowed to ride in them with a servant so, driver? Or? Uh, 
a little bit of both. Um, in particular, it's about whether or not women could drive, be in some of them. And um, uh, it's not Julius Caesar, maybe it's Cicero's mother. Somebody's um, mother had to get special permission to be able to drive in a certain area with a certain type of vehicle. Um, and so it's not unusual to see that type of restriction um, generally in a certain area. Was we, and it gets into that whole being feminine type of thing. And eventually we get to the idea that only women and children or sick people um, are in carriages. And that kind of stays that way until we get some uh, royalty that don't want to walk, uh, really is what happens. And um, we get some kings that are a little portly and they, they mm -hmm. start using carriages. And the roads get better. Um, and so really, all the way from Roman times, there's some type of restriction or social pressure as to who does or doesn't ride in vehicles. Um, it, who is or is it transported in a vehicle? And um, then once we get into the 1700s, that's when it gets written down and we get things like proper turnout and, and how the groom should be dressed and how the footman is dressed and that type of thing. But that doesn't come till a little bit later. Um, and the same thing cool. is true. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just saying that was cool. Yeah, yeah, and the whole idea of whether or not you ride with the vehicle, in, in the vehicle, or whether you walk next to it, that type of thing, it, it becomes a lot on whether or not you're a trader or whether you're somebody that's wealthy, or, and then eventually, um, whether or not you ride the horse while you're, um, uh, so you're doing postillion, and there's nobody, uh, driving the horse, you're riding them instead while pulling the wagon. Um, that becomes another social thing. And uh, some of that was because of effectiveness and stuff like that, but it becomes a society thing uh, later in, I think, the 1800s when um, they decided to put people, they weren't necessarily spies, but they were people that were willing to trade information for money um, <laughs> as coachmen. And um, some secrets got shared. And so on royal vehicles, there was not a footman or a coachman. Everybody was put far enough away so they couldn't hear what was going on in the carriage. So you couldn't spill the secrets. <laughs> but, um, that's technically outside a little bit outside of SCA times, but um, that's why you see that with royalty today. And that's why it how it evolved. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, so uh, I am on uh, SCA Equestrian a lot. I am also on Golf Wasn't uh, Equestrian page um, and uh, would be happy to answer any questions you have along the way, um, particularly about harness and that type of thing. This is kind of how I make my living is is working with this type of thing but i'm always happy to help anybody out thank you for teaching okay. have a great evening all right thank you so